Hey guys, today I'm going to tell you why Andrew Yang will be the best president in terms of demographics, in terms of how much he makes. So he grew up in a household of two, uh, his parents are both first generation immigrants, meaning that they came over from Taiwan to the US. They left their family, their friends, and pretty much thousands of years of living in Taiwan or China. You know, there is a political debate, of course, and uh, I'm not going to get into that because that would take all video. But regardless, when you're an immigrant, uh, you move to this country. My parents came, my dad came here with $50. Um, he worked in the University of Akron. Uh, we used to uh, visit Akron. I remember visiting Akron again because it is a special place from, for us uh, because that's the first place my dad went i mean he was a grad student or a grad research assistant so not like a student i guess he was a student but more of um he had already had his phd in china at the time i came very young he got his phd in two years or two and a half years which is pretty crazy but then again yeah makes sense uh to me at least so when you grow up in a very poor home which is where i grew up in um, we had apartments, so we lived in apartments, so we had to cross a highway to get food because we didn't have an extra car when my dad would, our car had a hole in the bottom of it and it would be broken probably 40% of the time you try to turn it on, it would not work. And we had this uh, auto mechanic and being poor means you see the best in people and you see the absolute worst in people because when people feel like you can't help them, they will treat you extremely bad. And at the same time, when people feel like you can't help yourself, they might treat you really well. And I see this too when I volunteer at animal shelters. Um, it's not, you can tell, I volunteered uh, and it's been part of, I guess, my upbringing. I, when I was in middle school, I volunteered at a retirement house, Sunrise Retirement House, a retirement living next to Target. And all my friends, they did all the fun stuff and I was forced to volunteer during summertime and then I volunteered with my um, best friend during high school. And then in college, obviously, I volunteered a ton too because it's New York City, Habitat for Humanity. And I remember the one benefit of Habitat for Humanity was you got like a 40% off discount to Barnes & Nobles. So I gave everyone books for Christmas all the time, and they got really pissed. Eventually, my friends got upset at that because they knew I was using a discount. Anyway. That's neither here nor there. But you want a president who has interacted with people on the streets, who have, who donates to homeless people, who works in charities, who sees what the average person is going through. And there's a difference between, I would say, Andrew Yang and every other candidate in that he, at one point, was very poor uh, when he was a child. Uh, immigrant families, first generation immigrant families are poor. By definition, they're coming to a country that they don't have any connection to, that they don't know anyone, because they're willing to give up what they had, which cannot be very much. If they're rich in Taiwan, why move, why immigrant to the US, right? Like my parents, if they're wealthy in China, why move? Like, why would you even want to come to the US? The answer is probably not. So when you deal with uh, immigrant families, uh, they're different. The mentality is very different. I can tell you that much. Um, you meet people um, who are as poor as you, because again, you stay at poor apartments. Um, I have pictures of this. So like it's maybe one day I'll ask my parents to, you know, do a photo slideshow of the picture of like. But I mean, it was poor. The first birthday uh, party I went to, I think it was in kindergarten, and we gave I gave a single pencil. That's his day. We we get I, and that was a gift. And the kid got like all the transformers. I don't know what was popular at the time, but it was a lot of like really gaudy gifts. And we gave him a pencil, and I was not invited back to any other birthday parties <laughs> for many years actually. And there is um, a. It's not only, you know, how, how, how much money do you make today? It's how much money do you, I mean, what type of childhood did you have? 
And Andrew has been very open, and he said that he was bullied. Um, poor kids are bullied for their clothing, for what they wear. I mean, we I just had um, – my sister had hand-me-downs, and I'm a guy, and she's not. So, I mean, they kind of look weird, right? Tom Boreyesque. Uh, we would get our haircuts at home. Uh, I remember that was a big deal because the haircut place was too expensive. And you grow up uh, realizing that, and you know, I was actually much happier when I was poor than when I got money, to be quite frank with you. Um, I remember my childhood very fondly because you spend a lot of time with your family when you're poor, at least in my family, because you go to the company to pick chestnuts. Uh, my, my dad worked at a company and they had chestnut trees or yeah, chestnuts trees and chestnuts. I will always remember they have this spiky cover and you have to break the spiky cover to get the chestnut, put it into the paper grocery bag, take the grocery bags to Chinatown, trade it for store credit, and then buy your groceries using the store credit. That's how we ate was we picked chestnuts. And then if it wasn't chestnuts, we grew veggies out in the back. Um, and then we would sell the veggies to a, a, a church. Uh, when I was young, my babysitters were Jehovah Witnesses. I didn't realize that until like uh, until late. I was like, wait a second. They wore Jehovah Witnesses. Oh my gosh. Like, um, I didn't realize that until college because I just assumed that we uh, were paying the babysitters or something. But they were um, teaching me about money and debt. And I think uh, they have like Jehovah Witnesses. I think debt is a sin, if I'm correct. And that's why I have this. You know, I went to NYU and I went to William Mary Law School, both hyper expensive places to go, by the way. And I took on a ton of uh, debt. So I had $740,000 of debt total within the last, I mean, I'm only 32. So it must have been accumulated from when I was 18 until I was roughly 30. And then I paid it all off for owning a business. You want someone who can do that. That's a problem solver. That's someone who's not taking taxpayers' money and making... That's someone who has made his own money by creating something from nothing. That's an entrepreneur. And that's why entrepreneurs have a, such a sacred place in the American lore. Because we have the best entrepreneurs because we are the most creative people. Every other country... I mean, you look at China and they copy... Uber, they copy Lyft, they copy, I mean, basically they take our app, they copy it, they take, they invite Uber there, and then the government eventually runs Uber out. You ask why people can't use Google in China, it's because Google at one point refused to censor things, and they say, okay, we'll just copy it, Baidu. I own Baidu stock, by the way, so I obviously thought that was going to be a good idea, um, and that's it. I mean, every single great invention in the past 50 years was American made, right? Apple, Apple, and then now we have like Apple. So like the problem is when you are the technology leader, it costs a lot of money to make technology. Um, now you can patent it, but in China, who like, blank cares? I mean, I was a patent attorney for the largest Chinese IP law firm owned partially by the Chinese government. If you're a big company in China, you are owned or regulated heavily by the Chinese government. And that stifles creativity because why should I invent a $1 billion company when you, the government is just going to take it from me and then put in a dude called Jack Ma and now he's an instant select? No, I mean, there's no way Jack Ma came up with Alibaba, like not the story that they're telling. The guy's not like nearly smart enough to do something like that. Like when you look at Jeff, if you hear Jeff Bezos speak or you even look at a picture of him, he's a giant nerd. And that's what Steve Waz was as well. Like in uh, Steve Jobs, they played Magic the Gathering because they were giant nerds. I mean, nerds can recognize other nerds. And then you can also be like, huh. This guy applied to KFC seven times and was or KFC and he was rejected because he was not a good worker. Kind of like how Bernie Sanders, I, but only in America could someone, I always go back to this story because this story is just very haunting of what America would look like under the wrong person. It would be a socialist hippie commune where everyone did what they could and everyone would get health insurance, everyone would get student, free student loan forgiveness and so on and so forth. But then Bernie would be so lazy that they would have to kick him out of the commune. 
there would be people so lazy, they drag the whole system down and they need to be kicked out. Just think about that for a moment. You're in a hippie commune where everyone is doing the best they can do, but some people are not going to do the best they can do, Bernie Sanders, and you're forced, you have this great philosophy and you want it to work because you want, I mean, Bernie, I mean, Bernie later became a senator, but you want him to promote your commune, right? If Bernie was promoting his commune, it would get a lot bigger, but you have to kick him out even though he's a valuable asset. It just doesn't sound like the socialism that Bernie is stating and they had to block their Twitter accounts and the Bernie bros believe in. It makes sense for lazy people, right? Because, hey, why don't I, if, let's say there's 100 people stuck in an island and 90 of them are Bernie bros. The island is effed. No one would do anything. The 10 people would eventually have to give up or they would have to start their own little tribe. And that's what happened when Bernie dro joined a hippie commune. He was so lazy that they'd kick them out. Hard work right now for younger people, they don't want to do it. They want forgiveness. I mean, just even the name of these programs, for all, healthcare for all, forgive, student loan forgiveness. What are you forgiving? Poor decision making? Like what? You need, we need a president who is responsible and who can create, who is a creator, not a forgiver, not someone who eats our tax money, that could go to a library or the road or the pothole over there. You know, why are these dudes getting paid so much? That you realize Bernie and AOC and uh, Amy, they get paid from our money. They don't actually make anything, right? They don't make a business. They kind of, right? Maybe they make a book that's ghost written, but that's about it. Hi, guys.